Thank you so much for joining us today for our Hispanic Philanthropy Conference. My name is Nancy Horvath, and I am the chair of the Inclusion and Equity Committee here in Toronto with the Association of Fundraising Professionals Toronto Chapter. I also sit on the executive of the Diversity to Inclusion series, which this is one of 12 conferences uh, that this one is part of, and I also work at the Sick Kids Foundation. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the 11th conference of this series today. And this whole series is, uh, has a special focus on philanthropy in different communities. Today, obviously, we're focused on the Hispanic community. Before I invite our chair, Mauricio Espina, up, up to say a few words, I really want to provide you with a quick background on this initiative. Um, Ontario's urban centres are amongst the most socially and culturally diverse places. Over three million people here consider themselves to be either visible minor to, to be visible minorities, and in recent years we have made some considerable strides in areas such as gender equity, accessibility, and diversity training across all sectors. Almost three years ago, it's hard to believe uh, three years passes so quickly, um, in partnership with the Association of Fundraising Professionals here in Toronto and Ottawa, we applied for funding through the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration's Partnership Project Office to launch a series of conferences that would allow us to take a long-term view on um, inclusion by uncovering stories about giving amongst emerging donor groups and to carve out a dedicated space for an honest exchange about how to strengthen our work and relationships within our communities. Our project is really a number of organized presentations that bring together, for the first time anywhere in Canada, donors, fundraisers, volunteers, nonprofit managers to look at what we know and also what we don't know about giving within the community and how we can work better to become a world-class, forward-thinking and inclusively-minded sector. Over the last two years, in addition to this conference, the association has organized similar gatherings in Toronto and Ottawa that have focused on philanthropy within the following groups. The South Asian community, the indigenous community, Chinese community, and the Muslim community. We have cut across diasporas, cultures, and faith, and we have also looked at other dimensions of inclusion by focusing on philanthropy and women, the LGBT community, people with disabilities, youth, and Francophone Ontarians. In fact, the final conference of the series is the People with Disabilities and Philanthropy, and it will be happening in Ottawa on October the 12th. Each of these conferences has also been video recorded and archived for future references on our website, which is www.afpinclusivegiving.ca. The best part is that all of these materials are available for free and the conversations are continuing through our Twitter and our Facebook page. So even if you haven't been able to join us for one of the other sessions, you can go onto the website and take some, uh, take some of the learnings away. In fact, if you're actually on Twitter today, we would like you to be tweeting about this conference. There are uh, cards on your table, so please use the hashtag inclusive giving. We've found at the end of every conference, it's been a really fantastic way to sort of uh, capture all of the sound bites from, from the learnings. Um, we also have our Inclusive Giving Facebook page, as I mentioned, so you can like that as well. When we set out on this project and this journey uh, three years ago, we, have art we articulated five overarching learning outcomes for the project. The first was we wanted to develop our cross-cultural competencies. Uh, we also wanted to rethink and examine the ways in which fundraisers identify with, cultivate, solicit, and thank donors who support our organizations. Third, we wanted to learn about the best ways to promote and engage people on the ground and both on, both on the ground and at leadership levels. We also wanted to gain an appreciation of the nuances found within each community, the diversity within diversity factor. And finally, we wanted to offer cross-cultural networking opportunities and develop a research initiative that stems from these events. At the end, we hope that we will have created a foundation from which new conversations will emerge and more advanced information sharing can take place. As I said earlier, this is the first time for our sector in Ontario and in Canada, some have even told us in North America, that we have approached diversity, inclusion, giving, philanthropy with such rigor and deep coordination. So let's treat today as an opening conversation uh, thank you all so much for your interest in this work and for coming today. We are so pleased to be able to shine light on Hispanic philanthropy, and I am delighted to be able to invite Mauricio Ospina, our advisory committee chair, up to welcome you all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, making uh, your time available for this uh, conference. It's the first of its kind in our community here in Toronto, at least. Um, we, our community, is united by the Spanish language. And so hence, we tend to call ourselves Hispanics. 
some other people call us Latin, but nevertheless, the point is uh, it's Spanish what unites us. Our community has been in Canada for about 70 years, and our influence is on the rise. The knowledge, for example, and skills of Hispanic Canadians is essential to companies that want to do business internationally. Canadian companies in, in, in the region are very visible in resource, in financial, industrial, and agricultural sectors. Our universities also have very strong academic uh, partnerships in, in the region. And today, Spanish is the third most commonly spoken language in Canada after English and French. Let us remember that Chinese is not one language, it's actually two. And this is based, it's uh, Mandarin and Cantonese. Uh, and this is based on a study done by the Canadian Foundation for the Americas three years ago. So it's not, it's not just we, native speakers, but also you learning Spanish, like Nancy, for example, who is fluent in Spanish, by the way. Let me just show you some numbers, just hear some numbers about our community. And this is based on a study that we commissioned from Statistics Canada. In 2006, in that census, there, um, there, um, we, we've, my apologies, let me just go back. There have been five major Hispanic waves of immigration to Canada. The largest and the most recent is known as the professional wave, which began in 1990. Close to 40% of all Hispanic immigrants came to Canada within the last 20 years, compared only to 33% for all immigrants to Canada. We are popular in this country, taking over. In 2008, in 2006, my apologies, there were 741,000 Hispanics in Canada, about 30% in Toronto. Today, we are close to a million. This is important. We are five years younger and more likely to be university educated than other Canadians. So this number, and along, uh, along with many other initiatives in the community, including one that I run every, every year for seven years, the 10 most influential Hispanic Canadians, enable me to say effectively that Hispanics are Canada's creative class. And I can be sued for that uh, tagline, but it's the truth. <laughs> Around the world, <laughs> Uh, close to 500 million people speak Spanish as their native language, making it second only to Mandarin. Our growth in Canada and internationally has resulted in plenty of charitable organizations seeking to address community as well as global issues. So together with uh, Nancy, Cynthia, and Christian, we assemble a tremendous group of nonprofit leaders, fundraisers, and donors who will share their experiences within our community, which bring me to our keynote today, my friend Alex Haddad. Alex Haddad is a researcher that seeks to improve health utilizing technology. His bio and accomplishments are way too long, but I will highlight a couple. He was born and educated in Colombia as a physician. When he was 20 years old, he was already an international expert on addiction issues. Several years ago, he developed the most widely used tool to assess the quality of clinical trials. His Haddad scale, as is known, is now used throughout the world. In 1999, he went to, to teach at Oxford University. Then, then he came to Canada, where he founded the Center for Global eHealth Innovation. Let me just run three of his titles, current, current type positions. Canada researchers, researcher in health innovation professor and senior scientist, University of Toronto, a staff physician, University Health Network. In, he was featured twice by Time Magazine as one of the new Canadians who will shape Canada in the 21st century, and as one of the leading medical researchers in the country. Alex has won many awards nationally and internationally, including our own 10 most influential Hispanic Canadians. He has been called a human internet, he has held high-level strategic meetings with, uh, related to health and technology with people such as Mikhail Gorbachev, Bob Geldof, Kofi Annan, Ro Rigoberta Menchu, and Al Gore. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend Alex Haddad. It's a real delight to be here today, and I couldn't resist the temptation to uh, come and share some ideas with you. And uh, I would be speaking at three different levels simultaneously. One, in terms of philanthropy and the state of, of the field. Then put some emphasis on Hispanic philanthropy and then try to address some of the needs and opportunities for the Hispanic 
community within the context of philanthropy. And this is why I chose this title, Quo Vadis Philanthropy. Where are you going, philanthropy? Hmm? What's happening in the 21st century? And I picked this uh, painting by Gauguin to, to guide the presentation. Uh, he said when he painted this, apparently after he heard that his favorite daughter had died in France, he abandoned his family and went to Tahiti to try to look for a simple life and probably to try to find the Garden of, of Eden. And he was a banker and he really left everything behind and um, really didn't find many differences in, in that community. He found probably syphilis, uh, which may have killed him. But then when he <laughs> learned that his daughter, his daughter had died, uh, he was very depressed, tried to commit suicide, and painted this, which he considered to be his masterpiece. He said, I will never ever paint anything better than this. But I'm bringing this not only because it describes the whole spectrum of life from birth, and he encouraged us to, to look at this painting from the right to the left. So you see a baby right at the beginning, and then an old woman preparing for death at the other end with some mystical figures. But what motivated me to, to use this is that this might be the only painting in the world whose title is three questions. And I love questions. I think they are the coolest things in, in the world, questions. <laughs> So, where are we from? It's the first one. The second one is, who are we? And the third is, where are we going? Okay. So, let's talk about philanthropy in general with some touches of Hispanic um, culture and, and see where are we coming from. When was the first time that the word philanthropy was used? But apparently, two and a half thousand years ago in a play that is attributed to Aeschylus, which is entitled Prometheus Bounded. Yeah. It's not clear whether he actually wrote it, but what the heck. And, um, and he used the, the word to represent this titan and his gesture towards humans, which was basically an act of love. Because his brother, who was a little dumb, Epimetheus, had distributed all sorts of wonderful things ac across all of the living creatures in the world, and then the humans were left naked, with no armor, with no big teeth, with no claws. So he infused in humans optimism, and then stole fire from the gods. And I think uh, fire, and many people think that fire represents creativity. Okay? So we humans, armed with our creativity and our optimism, are able to overcompensate for the weaknesses that we have and not having shields and claws and big teeth. And, yeah. So he was punished for doing that. Yeah. So he was chained and, and, and an eagle, as most of us uh, would know, would come and try to eat him every day. Yeah. And that was his punishment. But the word philanthropy used in, in this play represents uh, the humanity loving the tendency that Prometheus had. So philanthropy really has to do with love. Love of what makes us human. Love of the best we can show. So philanthropy and love are closely connected. Two and a half thousand years. Then <clears throat> we started to organize our activities and the church seems to have been the first organization in the world that made philanthropy a formal activity. And uh, Christianity, almost probably from the second century, started to motivate uh, acts of charity. It tried to level the playing field for the most disadvantaged and marginalized groups in our society. So with the collections on Sundays, uh, during Mass, the church was creating pools of money to try to satisfy the needs of those groups that were neglected. So we have uh, close to 2,000 years of, of tradition of organized philanthropy led by the church. And of course, with huge implications for the Hispanic world, for the Latin community in general. Because in fact, even today, 
in our culture for Hispanic people, um, charity is usually associated with religious groups. Okay? But what was happening uh, uh, as we continued to evolve as a species and enter the age of the Enlightenment? Yeah. In Scotland, a group of people started to revive the word philanthropy okay, and this love for humanity and emphasize the role of philanthropy as the essential key to human happiness. So the love of what makes us human should be the main source of happiness for us. And we need to cultivate this. So the Scots, uh, during the Enlightenment, started to emphasize the value of self-development through good deeds. If we are good to other people, and we develop ourselves by doing good, we are more likely to be happy. Okay? So philanthropy uh, was not connected to money specifically at this time, but with virtue. Yeah? So the world continued to, to evolve and we entered the industrial age. And then some people became very, very rich. And it was clear that when we were shifting from uh, an agricultural uh, species to an urban species, people started to move from the fields to the cities to work in factories, big social disparities started to emerge. Lots of poor people started to uh, be present in cities. So wealthy individuals, like in this case Thomas Coran, decided to use some of their money to try to address the needs of, the, of those marginalized communities. And this is perhaps the first example of an incorporated charity in the world. Okay? This man decided to create a corporation specifically devoted to managing his money as it was directed to meeting the needs of children. And these were uh, usually abandoned homeless children, but look at the infrastructure that was created during Victorian times. And, and there is a beautiful collection of little tokens that the parents of these kids would leave frequently with them as the only way to identify them. Later on, there were records of, of these children with birth certificates and all that. But at the very beginning, it was with these things. Uh, so the first incorporated charity in the world uh, gives us an example of how wealthy people decided to use money as the main tool for philanthropy. Okay? And this started to spread, yeah? because ch homeless children were not the main uh, marginalized group. Uh, here now the church and wealthy people started to join forces to try to rescue others, okay? prostitutes in this case, or single mothers who were regarded as sinners. Okay? And that gave birth to uh, the modeling asylums or laundries. Okay, these women would be taken to these homes that were run by nuns, and they would be engaged in really hard labor. They were washing a lot of clothes under horrible circumstances as a punishment for their sins. And their children would have been removed from them. Many of these children were sold to wealthy people in other parts of the world, mostly North America, and I really encourage you to check a movie, Philomena, okay, which talks about one of these cases. And, uh, and, and now it's starting to show that philanthropy does not necessarily lead to positive things all the time. That as anything in life, okay, good intentions can lead to harm. And this is an example of something motivated by very good intentions that ended up hurting a lot of people. So we need to be very careful in terms of assuming that just by pursuing a good cause, we are going to benefit those people who we are intending to support. Okay? Very, very important when we make decisions as to how resources should be allocated. And then another era really started to emerge. Very powerful people with a lot of money started to invest in good deeds. Okay? This is called capitalist philanthropy. Okay? 
is capitalism directed to solving the problems of society through money. And Cecil Rhodes captured very, very nicely the initial model of philanthropy driven by these capitalist titans. They would put money, but they were expecting returns on their investment of at least 5%. And there is a very interesting book called 5% Philanthropy okay, that shows how this really boomed as a, as, a, as a line of philanthropy in which you would try to solve housing problems, for example, as an investor. Okay? And with no apologies, this was absolutely uh, uh, um, recognized, it was recognized as a very honorable uh, activity and, and these individuals uh, became very prominent members of society and in a way uh, they were trying to buy respectability because most of them made money at the expense of other people. In fact, they were the people who were creating the disparities in society in the first place, now using their money for a profit to try to address the problems yeah, that they had generated. And unfortunately, this continues until today. This is the most prevalent and most powerful form of philanthropy. And as capitalism has been showing its power once communism failed, yeah. we are starting to see the widest gaps in the history of humanity in terms of income, to the point that even the World Development Forum considers income inequality as the second most important threat to our species, after terrorism and violent confrontation. And at Davos, they made income inequality the priority. Okay. And when we see figures like this, that the, 80, the 85 richest people in the world have more money than three and a half billion. And by the way, somebody told me that the two or three months ago, the number went down to 63, that the 63 richest people in the world have more money than three and a half billion people. Huh? Now we need to reflect a bit about whether we should continue to give so much value to money. Money is a symbol of wealth. Money is not wealth. Okay. Money is to wealth what inches or centimeters are to length. The units, the agreements. Money doesn't exist. We invented it. It's an agreement amongst ourselves that this thing we call a currency has value, but it has no intrinsic value. Okay? But we are putting a lot of emphasis on that. So we say, oh, we don't have money, so let's close this factory, or let's lay off 6,000 people. Why? Because we don't have money. Forgetting that there is something else which is called wealth. Wealth is the value that is generated in society when we combine resources, raw materials usually, with energy and knowledge. So laying off 6,000 people, for example, and say we, have, we need to let you go from this company because we have no money, is equivalent to telling workers, like a carpenter at the construction site, sorry mate, you cannot work here on this house because we run out of inches. Okay, and we learned that from Alan Watts. Okay? So a, a big message, and by the way, telephones, switch them off uh, or put them on vibration in a place where it would be pleasurable. <laughs> That's an element of e-health, and, um, and um, so we need to pay attention to this because the more we put emphasis on money, the more it will tend to accumulate in fewer and fewer homes, uh, hands until one or two people will own everything okay, at the expense of all of us. The main cause of disability in the world now, depression. The main cause of death amongst middle-aged working people, suicide. Okay. We are stressed, we are sad, we are overloaded in a system that is promoting more and more disparity. The game is rigged. Thomas Piketty, in his book Capital of the in the 21st Century, which is being reviewed 
very, very favorably by most of the economists in the world, regarded as the most important piece of economics in the last 200 years, shows that we stand no chance if we keep putting emphasis on money as the main outcome. We need to start rethinking in terms of wealth. So, of course, the main uh, philanthropists in the world are the richest people. Okay? And look at those figures. Bill Gates, 28 billion. Warren Buffett, 8 billion as part of a 20 billion dollar uh, pledge that he made. Soros, 8 billion. Okay? Mark Zuckerberg was the top philanthropist last year, close to a billion. And this number of very wealthy people uh, is a very limited one. And most of us end up, and I'm being recorded, uh, I need to be careful not to use words like ass leakers, yeah? <laughs> because it could be uh, misinterpreted. Okay? But we have become pretty much that. Okay? Oh, you give me a check, you put your name on a building. Oh! Okay? You understand? It's money, money, money calling the shots. And we are undervaluing all of the other sources of wealth. Ideas, hard work, talent, commitment, passion, love. Nah. Money, 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 money. And the main outcome in the philanthropy world now is how much money is raised. And everybody's in the same race, competing with each other. And in small environments, what happens is division, tensions, constant competition an impossible satisfaction. Because if there is one thing for which there is not enough for humans is money. We can eat and eat and eat, and there is a point beyond which you say, I, I cannot eat more. We can sleep and sleep and sleep, and there is a point beyond which we cannot sleep more. I can exercise, exercise, and exercise. There is a point beyond which I cannot exercise more. But money, no limits. So we need to be very, 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 very careful when we set as our main goal the accumulation of money. Yeah. Big trap for all of us. Yeah. And a lot of gender inequality or gender inequity. This is a world in which most fundraisers are females and most donors are male. I just need to look at this room okay, to confirm that. So, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yeah, Melinda. What is her maiden surname? What was Melinda Gates' name before she got married to Bill Gates? Anybody here? Uh, you can Google it, of course. <laughs> so when you find it, please let me know. But look at this. Yeah. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tell me something about Melinda. What was her surname, for God's sake? Eh? She acquired value when she acquired the surname. Why? Not fair. Mark Zuckerberg, comma, wife, top list of biggest charitable givers. She's a physician, a pediatrician, very accomplished professional, comma, wife. Eh? <laughs> Does wife have a name? And this is the language that we are using in the world of philanthropy. And it's driven by money. And most of us have become mercenaries, doing, thing, doing things in the pursuit of money. And what is the humanity-loving side of it? What is the self-development, the encouragement and the nourishment of what should make us proud to be human? No, it's who has it bigger in terms of the amount of dollars raised at the end of the year. Yeah? So I think it's time for us to go back to basics and to reflect upon why we do what we do. Because all of us here are involved in philanthropy or in one way or another. So when you find the surnames and the names, please let me know. Okay. There you go. French, and Christina Chan, 
There you go. We should celebrate them, okay? We should really celebrate them and recognize them. How many times in our lives we say, wife? Okay. Mr. and Mrs. whatever rich guy. Okay, then we have incredible uh, 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 examples of innovation in a world which is very conservative. The tools of philanthropy are boring. Balls, runs, biking, yeah? dining. Give me a check for this cause. So we're all competing. Oh, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And these people, small group, deciding who to bless with their financial power. Yeah? And then boom, like a nice bucket challenge comes <laughs> and disrupts the world of philanthropy. Why didn't we think about that? How could people okay, get a bucket of ice with water and dump it on, our, uh, on their heads and raise a humongous amount of money in a short period of time for a charity that not very few people had heard about, it? ALS. And then we cannot do it now, <laughs> because if they did it now, we cannot do another ice bucket challenge, okay? <laughs> I wish I had thought about it. Eh? The question is, what is the message that the ice bucket challenge is giving to us in terms of philanthropy? Is it humanity loving or narcissism? Just reinforcing the most predominant trait of humans these days, reinforced by social networking, which is I'm the center of the universe and I'm going to show you that I exist. Yeah. Did people actually learn about ALS, which was one of the main purposes of this, was to raise, to raise awareness about this disease, to make people okay, more knowledgeable about something that is very tragic for those who experience it and raise money for it. Will people who contributed money to the foundation behind this, the charity, will they contribute more money? Or they said, I did my bit. Now I need another big splashy thing to be motivated. It will be very interesting to see what happens in terms of donations for this group after the fad fades. So then we have cases like this. The biggest philanthropist and after I in this bucket of ice on my the world in terms of a foundation so with the biggest Gates, individual one, uh, Mark Facebook, Zuckerberg, and daring and Bill Gates to Hayes take Hayes. the challenge. I mean, here we see the ultimate expression of capitalist philanthropy. I'm glad to give to ALS. Together. It's a great cause, but I, I can I give. How much money did Bill Gates give to ALS? Do it we don't better know. Huh? And it's been done. Been I'm going to do it this. better than anybody you know, else. Got this design. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. It's going to be great. Mm. I'm here to join the people bringing attention to Lou Gehrig's disease by taking the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm going to challenge three more people, Elon Musk, Ryan Seacrest, and Chris Anderson of TED. Consider yourself challenged. You have 24 hours. Good luck. we mobilize all that energy to do something sustainable and that could actually enable us to tackle some of the biggest challenges we are facing as a species. Okay? At a time when a lot of people believe that we are accelerating our process of extinction. Some people believe that our children will not see their grandchildren. Okay? Imagine mobilizing the creativity of humans to really tackle global warming. Okay. Polarization of groups, religious, political. The threat of violence, 
the world is at the threshold of another nuclear war right now. Gender inequity, there is no single country in the world in which women and men have the same rights. Now, those are the biggies. Okay. ALS is an interesting one. And, and yes, we need to support causes like that. People suffer a lot. But the $100 million they raised will not find the cure. That's a drop in the bucket, pun intended, for what is needed. Okay. What causes should we support is the question. What is worth our effort? How can we do things harnessing the energy that we have? And we have here Peter Buffett, one of uh, Warren Buffett's sons, writing an op-ed piece for the, um, for the New York Times, saying, as more lives and communities are destroyed by the system that creates vast amounts of wealth for the few, the more heroic it sounds to give back. So we celebrate people for giving back after they have caused a lot of damage to society. It is what I would call conscience laundering, feeling better about extreme wealth by sprinkling a little around as an act of charity. Okay? This is the son of one of the biggest philanthropists in the world. So is this just what we are seeing now as modern philanthropy, a way for us to get atonement, forgiveness, for the damage that we have caused in the pursuit of accumulation of money? And are we contributing to the problem? Yeah. Are there alternatives? What's happening in the Hispanic world? Remember, the church has been the dominant force of philanthropy. So we have our richest person, Carlos Slim, Mexican. At this point, when he said what is quoted by uh, Forbes magazine, he was richer than Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And he said, among many other things, okay, that to donate their wealth would not solve any problems. And he did some math. He said even the Gates Foundation at 5% return per year, the amount of money that that generates is insignificant to tackle some of the big ones. That is not giving money the way for us to deal with the problems that we are facing. And we are talking here about foundations with billions of dollars. So let's reflect upon our own initiatives. How much do you have? $200,000? Half a million? 20 million? Make it a billion. What kind of difference could we really make at those levels? Yeah. In an environment which is becoming more and more fragmented. Efforts are taking place now in the US mostly to get the Hispanic community to join forces. Okay. What if we pulled our efforts instead of having all these little initiatives trying to raise resources to deal with the challenges of the Hispanic community? So there is this HIP Give, and HIP uh, Give is trying to explore the value of crowdsourcing, for example. Yeah. And they created a platform. And they showcase projects, but it's pathetic. Okay. Yeah, well done, bravo. You, you are using crowdsourcing for, crowd, for funding, crowdfunding. But look, $1,000, $130, $2,800, okay, out of $10,000, huge efforts for relatively little returns. Okay. Does it have a cultural element behind that? Not clear. Possibly, we just need to look at our cities in Latin America to realize that uh, collectivism, <laughs> joining forces, is not one of our strengths. Look at this street. There is a, I call it the sidewalk index. <laughs> one of my proxies for the level of development and civilization of a society is what happens in the sidewalks. Look at this. Boom, a wall, then a ramp, then stairs, then plants. Don't walk here. OK, I'm in my bunker. Huh? And uh, there is a problem with electricity in my town. I will build my own plant. I will put my own plant. There is no water. I will create my own water treatment thing. And I don't trust politicians. I don't trust anybody. I will not give money to charity. Why? These people are going to steal my money. Okay? 
So there is no culture within the Hispanic community to write big checks and give them to an entity to do something with it. We either give it to the church, or if we are an artist like Shakira or Juanes and all that, I create my own foundation and I use my own money. And I can control it. So we have a big cultural element to take into account. At the same time, there are examples of organizations that have decided to join forces to try to increase their ability to make a difference. And the United Way is one of them. Okay? Relatively recently, the United Way became the United Way worldwide. Okay? So this is an aggregation of aggregations of efforts to raise funds. So I'm wondering if there is an opportunity for us within the Hispanic world to join forces. And instead of being supporting little bits and pieces here and there, we might be able to create a collective effort to work with the philanthropy community to see if we can really do something meaningful and overcome some of our fears and our cultural barriers to do these kind of things. And look, it's been very successful for the United uh, Way. It's the number one uh, charity in the US yeah, uh, now and, uh, and uh, probably in the world. And uh, we also have another example. The Economist was trying to estimate the amount of money that the Catholic Church has. It may be, in fact, the biggest uh, uh, charity in the world. And uh, with $170 billion a year in the US alone, so probably over $300 billion, bigger than Apple okay, in the world, most of it going to, to, to healthcare, a big chunk to colleges and universities. Okay? So we have a big, powerful CEO of the biggest charity in the world, who is from Latin America. Okay? And I think there is a lot we could learn from, from the Catholic Church as to how to distribute the efforts to attract resources and then to go for common causes together at huge levels. And a lot of these generated by Hispanics. Yeah. And uh, what if we used opportunities like this to have conversations about new modalities that would allow us to join forces transcending our traditional boundaries and joining forces with those who are supporting this with groups that are present here to see if, if together we could um, achieve much more than what we would achieve uh, separately. And now uh, we have another big important uh, potential uh, source of energy, which is the Pan American Games in Toronto. 250,000 people coming next year, 41 countries represented here, most of them from the Hispanic world. How could we use the energy of the games, for example, of many, many big activities that congregate Hispanic uh, people to do something in a completely different way and much more effective? And, and at the end, you see, see how we could set an example of leadership and see if together we could not only rethink, but reinvent philanthropy for the good of humanity. Thank you very much.